delighted to introduce you tonight to uh, Mr. Paul Sara. And Paul is a great friend of the college. He's been here so many times in the mm -hmm. context of Business Ethics Week, but also participates on, in terms of many activities uh, in the college as well at the university level. So I'm really delighted that you know he agreed to come back. And, and like I was saying yesterday, over the last few days, this has been going on for over the last seven years, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. So I also do thank you for taking your time out of this Wednesday afternoon to come to listen to Paul. And, and before I let him go, I just want to talk a little bit about who he is and what he's done. So he's the past president of Clear Channel Outdoor of the, uh, the Milwaukee division, and he has been in the outdoor advertising business for nearly 38 years and most recently served as president of Clear Channel Outdoor Incorporated. And Clear Channel Outdoor is a subsidiary of Clear Channel Worldwide. It's headquartered in San Antonio, Texas, and is a global leader in out-of-home advertising. And some of the major venues of Clear Channel Outdoor include Times Squares, Spectaculars, Piccadilly Circus in London, Block E in Minneapolis, Millennium Park in LA, Fashion Show in Las Vegas, Dundas Square in Toronto, Westgate City Center in Glendale, Arizona, and Boardwalk in Atlantic City. So they have seen tremendous growth in the US market, and especially with the addition of unique and new out-of-home products, including the new digital billboards. So you add a talented and motivated team to the mix of new and innovative products, and you have the key ingredient for a successful business. And like the other speakers we've seen, Paul is also extremely involved in giving back to the community. And like I said, he's here giving back to the university. So he you know, has been a board member of the Better Business Bureau of Wisconsin since 1996. And I think we've been tracked in that capacity as well. And served as the chairman of the board from 2003 to 2005. And asked why he became a member of the BBB, he says, business ethics is not an old-fashioned term, and the BBB is the benchmark for integrity and in business practices. So he currently still serves on the BBB board, and he believes in giving back to the community and is involved in a number of organizations, which include La Casa de Esperanza, the steering committee for Ronald McDonald Charities, Mahoney Foundation and also serves on the College of Business Advisory Board here and is a 2008 graduate of the S FBI Citizens Academy. <coughs> so Paul and his wife Jane reside in Macon, Wisconsin. They have three sons and the best thing about him is actually a graduate of UW-Whitewater and got a BS in administration in 1972. Thank you so much and please join me. Thank you for being, thank you, thank you. Oh, we're done. That took about a half hour, huh? Okay. Uh, once again, I, I'm just very pleased to uh, be here today to participate in the 2014 uh, Business Ethics Week uh, here at Whitewater. Uh, no matter where I go, I always hear nice things about this university, the IT, the marketing, the finance, so we've had a number of people in our organization, in fact, uh, work uh, or attend, graduate from, from Whitewater. So uh, the proof is in the pudding, the proof is in the people that you hire sometimes. So uh, what I'm, I think I'm most pleased about is that this university, how seriously it takes this, the topic of, of ethics, uh, how, it, how seriously it takes the topic of business code of ethics. Uh, it's commendable. Uh, essentially, there's four uh, factors that make up a successful business. There's, some people may disagree with that, but and some people may say there's a whole lot more. But number one is product. You have to have the right product. You have to have good people behind that product. Number three, you have to have execution. You have to be able to have people execute the plan. And number four, uh, integrity. And I put the emphasis on integrity. Uh, 
I forgot my glasses, which is not a good thing, but <laughs> I'll try to read as best as possible. Oh, it's right. Are they right here? Oh, here they are. Good. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Today I would like to divide my talk into, th into uh, three parts. Number one, examples of people in companies that uh, compromised integrity and ethics and the consequences that followed. Uh, I'd like to also give two examples of socially responsible companies and how it benefits those companies, employees, community, and the environment. And number three, I'd like to uh, give some pointers on how to best prepare for the workplace. Uh, what students here and elsewhere need to do to prepare for what's coming in this rapidly changing world economy. And I put the emphasis on rapidly changing. And it's changing like you can't believe. I, I, I see it every day of my life. Um, it's so important to that we have a discussion about business ethics, conduct and ethics in our universities to help advance and place the proper emphasis and importance on ethics, integrity, humility, courage, and respect for one another. Uh, that we put into action a strong and solid code of ethics as each of you enter the workforce and become the future worker, managers, and CEOs and business leaders of, of, of this country. Each of you has a responsibility to act with absolute integrity and honesty in all that you do. It's contagious. Without trust, integrity, and honesty, a business will die and the damage to its employees, shareholders, and community will be enormous. Some of the reckless and irresponsible behavior demonstrated in business in recent years is disturbing. In cases where businesses compromise their responsibility to conduct themselves with absolute integrity and honesty resulted in the destruction of large companies, people lost jobs, in some cases losing their entire 401k holdings because they had most or all of their 401k holdings in, in company stock. Greed and unethical behavior in some of those companies wiped out shareholder value. People went to jail and caused great mistrust of Wall Street and business in general. I do want to say that unethical, reckless behavior in biz is not the norm, but rather than the exception. And bad behavior, bad ethics can happen in any field. It can happen in the military, it can happen in the uh, religious field, it can happen in the teaching profession, it can happen anywhere. But since this is a predominantly a business class, I'm going to talk about how it, pertains, how it pertains to business. I can say that after nearly 42 years in business, through my association with business leaders, that a high degree of integrity exists in the world of business. So don't panic. However, there is a small percentage where integrity and honesty are com com compromised and will eventually have a devastating effect on the business, its employees, its vendors, and the community. The destruction can happen as quickly and be as destructive as an F5 tornado. A factor as to why a breakdown in integrity can occur in a business may be because of the highly competitive nature of business today. It comes down to survival of the fittest, get it done now at any cost, ethics be damned. We can't and won't allow the other guy to beat us to market. It's be become a culture of who can implement smoother, innovate better, and execute faster. Only the best will survive and thrive. Those who don't will become irrelevant or die. One just need to look at the Nokia flip phone or the Blackberry. They were once the king of the hill just in the past decade. Now they're just a memory or have a very, very small share of the market. Nokia had a 63% share of the market in 2007. Today it has a 3% market, market share. Yahoo and AOL were leaders in their respective fields at one time. Both are trying to make a comeback, but it's all uphill. And the search companies are a very crowded field. 
There are other businesses such as Best Buy, which has become a showroom for Amazon, Blockbuster, Kodak, Polaroid, some of these names you don't even remember, American TV and Appliance just went bankrupt in Milwaukee area, MI Bank, and the list goes on and on. There is an insatiable appetite to be better, faster, and outdo your competition, and always attempt to live up to the expectations of shareholders and the demands of analysts on Wall Street. For some leaders, a code of business conduct and ethics are just words without meaning. We'll look at some of the companies that ignore the rules of good business conduct and ethics and the consequences of ignoring right from wrong. There are always consequences when ethics is compromised. I was glad to see that our company this past year revised the code of business conduct and ethics. All are made to read and sign the code. Some very, very strong guidelines. This is a 40 page code of business conduct and ethics. Everybody's required to read this and sign it and understand it. And I can say that after my 38 years with this company, uh, this is the, the one thing that's followed very closely. You'll be gone if you violate this code of ethics. So I was very glad to see that this was revised this past year and everyone had to read it and everyone had to sign it. Strong guidelines, but unless our corporate leaders and employees follow these rules and guidelines, we could end up just like Enron, once a thriving giant energy trading company, natural gas electric utility company based in Houston, Texas. It employed about 21,000 people by mid-2001 before it went bankrupt. Fraudulent accounting behavior techniques allowed by their leaders, Kenneth Lay, now deceased, and Jeff Skilling, serving a long prison sentence, ruined 21,000 lives, employees' lives, and caused their share price to plunge to 30 cents. Then there was WorldCom, led by Burning Evers, another accounting scandal that created billions in illusory earnings. This is a company that had made more than $107 billion in market cap, far surpassing Enron. It improperly accounted for more than $3.8 billion in expenses. What was the result? What were the consequences? Bankruptcy, the largest U.S. bankruptcy case at the time. It ruined the lives of thousands of employees and shareholder value completely wiped out. Then there was Tyco. CEO Dennis Kozlowski and finance chief Mark Swartz were sentenced up to 25 years in prison for stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from the company. You may recall a company closer to home, a company by the name of Cost Corporation, a lady by the name of Sue Sakdiva, their VP of Finance, went on a 30, $31 million shopping spree that unfortunately was not discovered by auditors. Uh, that's unbelievable in itself. Uh, even the auditors, uh, some of the, the auditor, auditing company went out of business as well. It went in notice for several years and almost brought down the company. We all recall, to some extent, and are still feeling the effects of the financial housing crisis of 2008. The actions of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac went so deep into subprime and other risky mortgages that there was no way out and resulted in the largest real estate bubble burst. And then there were the banks that were willing to lend to anyone who had a heartbeat. No questions asked, how much do you want? And yes, part of the blame must go to the U.S. consumer who wanted a piece of the American dream at any price. Greed prevailed, ethics be damned. Consequences, ladies and gentlemen. The story never ends well when good intentions are compromised. When business conduct and ethics are ignored, winner take all, ethics be damned, there are consequences. We all paid the price and to some extent are still paying the price of the financial crisis of 2008 caused by greed and unethical behavior. The irresponsible behavior of leaders from Enron, Tyco, WorldCom brought down billion dollar companies jobs lost, 
401ks becoming worthless because so many employees had their 401ks tied up in company stock. How about the recent criminal probe of General Motors? In February of 2014, the big automaker recalled 1.6 million cars worldwide because their ignition switches might move out of the run position into an accessory position, shutting off the engine and disabling airbags and other systems. <clears throat> GM says it knows of 31 crashes and 13 deaths, and as a result, the defective ignition switch and airbag problem. Here's the problem. The automaker allegedly knew as early as 2004 that the switches might malfunction but kept it quiet. I ask you to stay tuned to this one. This is one that's going to be continuing. When a culture goes from excellence based on a strong code of ethics and integrity to a culture based on self-gain, profit at any cost, known as greed, one in which the end justifies the means, I guarantee you that the ending will not end pretty. I want to just give you an example of something I personally experienced back about six, seven years ago. The president of our company called, us, called me up and said, Paul, can you hop a plane? We have a problem, uh, an auditing problem in one of our, our divisions. So I hopped the plane got there that Monday and he said, this is what happened. Uh, we had four individuals in this particular division that uh, what would you, what would, essentially manipulated uh, revenues and uh, really jeopardized a large contract with this particular uh, organization. Uh, those four people were eventually terminated. Uh, we met one of the individuals at a hotel and the president of our company uh, was speaking to one of the four people that was terminated. And uh, Paul said to this individual, or actually the individual said to Paul, our president, uh, you know, I didn't do anything. Other people did it. And Paul's response to this individual was, it's not what you did, it's what you didn't do. Sometimes knowing something and allowing bad things to happen uh, is just as flagrant, is just as wrong. And it cost the company millions and, and, and caused uh, a reputation. It also, and I knew a number of these people being with the company for nearly 38 years, you know a lot of people, and at this particular division we had 150 people, and looking in the eyes of those people and trying to figure out what happened and why it happened, uh, it, it took a severe hit to morale for that particular division uh, for a long time. So sometimes it's not what you do, it's what you don't do. Uh, and I know a number, how many people in this room are finance or in accounting or Okay, so let that be a lesson. If you, if you see something wrong, you know, if you did something wrong, it's one thing, but if you know something wrong, uh, you need to report it immediately. We, have, uh, we also have this clear channel hotline, and it's a confidential way of, of our employees to uh, contact. Uh, it's an open door policy and contact our corporate headquarters to help employees resolve concerns. So, um, you know, Again, ethics and, and, and the integrity of a company are, are so essential. Uh, I'm what you call a stock aficionado, wannabe, emphasis on the wannabe. Uh, I invest in a variety of stocks as more of a hobby or of a pastime. I've done okay, uh, but it's more about the curiosity of, of different companies and what they do and how they get started. Uh, I encourage you to do that because it's a, it's, it's a great way of understanding companies that, uh, or industries that you know little about. Um, anyway, I, I, I try to study how they get started, keep going, how long they've been in business and what makes them uh, tick really, really interests me. Uh, I really try to examine a business prior to investing in them. I read Barron's, uh, Motley Fool, Wall Street Journal, 
read business books, do research on the internet, uh, read annual reports, all kinds of things, uh, sometimes even help put me to sleep. Uh, when reading the annual reports, I look at their five-year annual revenues, expenses, EBITDA, competition, their 10Ks, uh, and most of all, I try to read the CEO's annual summary letter. That'll tell you a lot about what's going on uh, and, the, and the innovation outlook. Uh, these are all things an investor should consider prior to making a financial commitment to buying a particular stock. What you don't see in the financials is a line called business ethics performance. You can't quantify that. No company, or I should say few companies, seldom go into any kind of depth about their code of business conduct and ethics. It's more or less assumed that management is trustworthy and will always do the right thing. They will choose honest practices when running their respective business. In conference calls to analysts that I have listened in on, there is an absence of any discussion of code of conduct or behavior unless, of course, there was some type of investigation or wrongdoing that occurred. The discussion is usually centered in on the past quarter performance and visibility into future performance and not ethics. Ladies and gentlemen, the examples I gave earlier of Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, and Cost are just a few examples of destruct destructive unethical behavior. Studying a company's financials, their competition, their leadership, and innovations are extremely important when consider considering to invest or possibly work for a company. Nothing Nothing will bring down a company faster than corruption, greed, or compromising the code of business conduct and ethics. <clears throat> you can fix performance, you can improve product, change people, but in mo ca most cases you can't fix a bad business code of ethics. In most cases, fast enough to save a company. I place trust a strong code of business conduct and ethics at the top of my list when considering to invest in the stock of a company. Like I say, you know, companies can get beat to the market, someone can beat the, you know, make a better product, whatever. But once that trust is violated, a company will, will, will die. My advice to each of you when looking at a prospective employer, you should look at their code of conduct to get a sense of their commitment to ethics in the workplace. I know jobs are hard to find, but you have to look at that because you're gonna be a victim of, of their lack of honesty and integrity at some point in time. You wanna work for the highly ethical company. You don't wanna work for a company that does not have a high standard of behavior. The second thing I'd like to talk about is uh, Social and corporate responsibility. Uh, I was only going to talk about one, but I, I'm going to talk about two here. Um, one is a Milwaukee company, and the other one is a, I believe it's centered in, uh, located in, in Washington. Uh, okay, we've talked about the consequences of bad conduct. Let's talk about an example of the good side of ethics in business, and one that focuses on the many things that a good business does right, because 99.5% of businesses do many, many wonderful things. It's what makes, it what makes America what it is, the great country that it is. And I refer to that as a social or corporate responsibility. Here's a company, uh, Potawatomi Bingo Casino. It doesn't matter how you feel about gambling, whatever, but they, you know, they published this social responsible uh, report. And basically, uh, uh, <clears throat> It gives a list of, 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 the, of the many things they're doing to give back or return to the community. Uh, and I think it's pretty impressive when I read this book. So I just want to kind of share it with you. 54% uh, of its 2,600 team members are people of color. Tempo, a professional organization that focuses on empowering women to achieve and sustain leadership roles, presented Potawatomi Casino with its Special Recognition Award for the casino's effort in hiring and promoting women. <clears throat> Potawatomi was presented with the 
uh, Patriot Award for its support of current team members on active duty, our soldiers. Donating reclaimed food items to hunger task, fo task force on a monthly basis to ensure less waste by the casino and provides a benefit to those in need. Uh, in 2012, the restaurant moved from styrofoam to recyclable, reusable microwave containers. Uh, I think one of their biggest uh, endeavors is this miracle on Canal Street, which our company was a big part of. A portion of their bingo proceeds, totaling over a million dollars each year, is given back to uh, 20, 20 different charities in the Milwaukee area, uh, such as Ronald McDonald House, which I'm very involved in, Sharp Literacy, Hunger Task Force, Habitat for Humanity, and 16 other charities. Uh, the list of their giving back to the community is impressive and shows the commitment to their community. Social responsibility is an example of a strong code of business, uh, business conduct and ethics. It's about choosing right from wrong, obeying the law. It's about how we treat others and fellow employees. It's about what we give back to the community. It's about respecting the environment or what can be referred to as environmental ethics. I've talked about a book, company in person in my past five talks here at Whitewater and, and quite frankly I can't find a better example of, of a company that touches on all the points I just mentioned in the company I just profiled. Um, it's a book written by the founder and owner of Patagonia his name is Yvonne Chenard. The book is called Let My People Go Surfing, The Education of a Relevant Businessman. Uh, he also did an hour talk at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm sure it's still on, on, on YouTube. It's about an hour long, and I encourage you to, to uh, look it up. Again, his name is Yvonne Chenard, uh, Pat, Chairman of pa Patagonia. Uh, hopefully it's still there. Uh, certainly be worth your time. Um, in the book, he points to two areas of social corporate responsibility, internal and external. Let's look at the internal first. Internal, it's a company's responsibility to treat your employees well. You should focus on the employee before anything else. Patagonia gives sufficient time off to its employees, allowing them to recharge themselves. Patagonia is financially sound. No funny accounting practices here. Mr. Chenard opened up one of the first in-office daycares. It benefits his business, but also creates a sense of worth. Here's the payoff for Patagonia. They get hundreds and hundreds of resumes every day. People want to work for Patagonia. They create and foster a loyal workforce. This isn't a company that takes it, takes, it gives. External responsibility. It is when the product of a company produces, that a company produces does the least amount of harm to the environment. Mr. Chenard went to his individual suppliers and although cotton is a product that grows naturally, he realized cotton grows, cotton growing does a lot of harm to the environment. You wouldn't think it does, but it does. He found that the synthetic fibers were the best to use because they do the least amount of damage to the environment because it used the least amount of fossil fuel to create the fiber. I'm proud to say that in 2013, Clear Channel Outdoor Milwaukee Division partnered with over 100 causes ranging from run, walks, health care issue, helplines, fundraising, and community awareness programs, contributing over 1.6 million advertising space just in the Milwaukee area. From time to time, our employees will cook and help serve meals to, familiar, to families staying at the Ronald McDonald House in Wauwatosa. This past three years, I've had the privilege to serve on the steering committee for the capital campaign to raise $10 million to double the size of the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, we will be able to accommodate 72 families, double the size it is right now, each night, and hopefully not have to turn away any families from a place of shelter when their child is ill. Uh, we broke ground last spring and the addition will become a reality in August of 2014. America, 
It has a culture of excellence. It is a country that provides the means for anyone to succeed if they really want to. Excellence and opportunity. These are qualities that separate us and our economic system from the rest of the world. It's when at any cost, by any means, or the means justifies the end, that crosses a line from <clears throat> ethical culture to a corrupted culture. There is a fine balance. It doesn't take much to tilt the scale. We saw that in a few examples I discussed earlier. One individual, a couple of bad apples, can do enormous damage to an institution or business, to its employees, to its shareholders, and to the community. A gentleman by the name of Stephen Covey wrote a book a few years ago called The Speed of Trust, The One Thing That Changes Everything. In the book, it goes on to say, trust is so basic to business that it is rarely discussed in an analytical and an accessible way. The more trust within a company, <clears throat> the faster it can move with lower cost. Think of the adverse impact 9-11 had on time and cost of air travel, longer lines and more security because of the damage it did to trust. He goes on to say in his book, integrity, without integrity you have no foundation on which to place trust. Covey defines integrity as being honest, telling the truth, and leaving the correct impression. Beyond honesty, integrity requires three things. Congruence, that is behavior consistent with your values, inspires trust. Humility, what is right has to be more important than being right, and courage. When the right action is hard, integrity requires courage. Trust is so integral to our relationships that we often take it for granted. Let me repeat that again. Trust is so integral to our relationships that we often take it for granted. And there is a quote from the late Christopher Reeves, a Superman character who tragically passed away in 2004 as a result of a fatal spinal cord injury. I love what he says. Our greatest human challenge is to behave according to our belief, to do the right thing, to practice what we preach, hold yourself to high standards, and continually evaluate the image you see in the mirror. It will build your character. Respect. Treat others with dignity and make sure your behaviors are respectful. It will make you a person of quality. Courage. There's that word again that Steve Covey used in his book. Follow your conscience instead of following the crowd. Integrity. Choose right, rightness over what is easy and convenient. We all have that little voice inside us that will guide us. It's called our conscience. If we shut out all the noise and clutter from our lives, and listen to that voice. It will tell us to do the right thing always. Thank you for listening. And I've got one more thing here. Uh, back uh, several years ago, leap year, when was that? Was that two or three years ago? Uh, let me take a sip of water here. We had a, uh, a three-person panel. Um, along with uh, a panel at Cal State, and it was uh, simul-broadcasted uh, to about, I think, 77 universities. Uh, and the purpose of it was to um, um, prepare, how to prepare our students here and elsewhere at Whitewater uh, for what's coming in this rapidly changing world economy. And uh, there's a few things that I want to pass on to you uh, that hopefully will help you in your search for employment. Um, number one is uh, be like Apple or Samsung. Innovate and reinvent yourself. 
invest, constantly invest in, educa in educating yourself. The world is changing too quickly not to do that. Make yourself relevant. Stay in tune with whatever's changing. Processes, systems, technology, self-development classes. <clears throat> your first job will probably not be your last job. I guarantee that's not going to happen these days. I've worked for this company for 38 years, and, and uh, that's, <laughs> that's probably not going to happen to too many of you. So, uh, you know, uh, it, your first job will probably not be your last job, but it may have a lot to do with determining your career path. Uh, we had a gal who worked as a, in a, in a proof of performance photography, and uh, she showed a keen interest in, in marketing. And um, uh, so we gave her the opportunity to, to take advantage of some small opportunities, and, and she eventually left our company, but she did get an, a, a terrific job with another marketing firm. So um, always try to constantly improve yourself don't get stuck in the mud employers are looking for employers are looking for 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 people who uh, not pushy but they they are looking for people who want to who, uh, who who, who want to take a greater role uh, greater responsibility and and you can demonstrate that by your initiative and in, in showing your interest to do something other than what you were maybe hired for believe me Good companies will give you that opportunity. Uh, pursue career choices early on. Attend job fairs. Ask questions at job fair employers. Network. Networking is, is, is so vital. You may not find the career choice you want, but it will allow, to allow you to inquire. You never know until you get out there. Uh, there is a great skill set needed to be going unfulfilled. Uh, there are you never know. You, you never know. There may be a, uh, a business out there that you've never heard of, and you may get the opportunity to talk that per to that person and learn about that business, and it may attract your interest. Who knows? There's just so many niche businesses these days, so keep your mind open to, to all things. Um, this may be a little difficult. You know, it's financial commitment, but, it, you know, think global. Um, if you can, try to attend a semester overseas if possible. Uh, my son did have the opportunity to attend a, a semester in London. Uh, there were about 15 young adults in his class uh, from a diverse background, I think from every country in this world. And um, he told me one day, he says, Dad, he says, I saw my competition and it's scaring me. And I said, what do you mean? He says, these kids are not only bright, but they speak two, three, four different languages. So your competition is not necessarily here. It's, it's globally. Uh, our CEO is, is uh, from London, uh, is now based in, in, um, in, in New York. So, I mean, you have all sorts of people from all parts of the world that are now taking positions. It's no longer American jobs in, in America. It's other countries coming to this country, people from this country going, going elsewhere. So a global approach to learning offers a diverse background to prospective employer. Uh, community involvement, uh, volunteer outreach. Join a service organization, uh, community organization. Do charitable work. Get back to the community. Start young. Um, I can't tell you uh, what I've learned over the years. I've learned more from people in these foundations and organizations than, than, than I've learned from people within my company. Because when you go to the office every day, you're talking to the same people. But you know, when you're you know working with people uh, in the community, they have a different perspective, and they can really help you in your particular position because many times they said, hey, how do you solve this problem? How do you solve that problem? And they take a totally unique approach to problem solving. So if you can uh, become a part of the community, uh, it's not only, it's not only going to help your business career, but it's also the right thing to do. 
Um, my son was also telling me a story about a, 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 a person who was very involved in activities other than, you know, uh, trying, to, trying, to, trying to get his degree, uh, helping out, you know, people from the Hurricane Katrina and all sorts of things. And employers like to see that on resumes. It's, if, if they see you, you know, you're, you're smart and, you know, you went to four years of college in Harvard or Whitewater or whatever, that's great. But they like to see multidimensional people. They like to see people that have something to, to, to give uh, beyond going to college. You have to make yourself relevant. You have to kind of make yourself unique. So, uh, and you know what? Ladies and gentlemen, it just helps you. It's the right thing to do, and, and there's just so much you learn from people. So I encourage you to, 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 to get involved in, in uh, community affairs. Uh, Jeff Jor Joris, the former CEO of Manpower, says being lifelong learners is crucial for employees. Every few years, you need to go back to universities for classes to brush up on their skills, to learn new things. If you can't embrace lifelong learning, your job will end before you want it to end. I know my son uh, went to college, finished you know, four years, and took a job and didn't really care for it. And he says, Dad, he says, I, I, just, I really don't care for what I'm doing. Went back, got his master's, and um, got the job he wanted. So, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you have to do what's necessary and, you know, to get what you want. So uh, learning is a lifelong job. So community and writing skills, technology, great leaders speak and write well. Um, I'm not a great speaker. <laughs> I don't write well. I wish I did, but I'm just passing along the advice to you. Uh, you know, Twitter, texting, Instagram, emails, all these things that are going on in social media, uh, it's wonderful, but it doesn't take the place of, of good writing and communication skills. Um, you know, people are looking uh, for business leaders that can communicate well. I don't have to tell you, technology is and will continue to play a larger role in everything we do, so keep learning. Um, LinkedIn profile. How, how many do you know about LinkedIn? Does everybody know? Yeah, okay. Make sure that that's up to date. I, you know, and I have a discussion with our HR people. We were this close to hiring what I thought was a terrific salesperson. Well, their LinkedIn profile was not good. And that was, that was the decisive reason why this person did not get the job. Uh, I mentored a student here uh, a couple of years ago, uh, actually a year ago, and I looked at his LinkedIn profile and it was fantastic. It was just the best, better than some of the professional people that I, um, that I meet. So make sure that that LinkedIn profile is relevant, up to date, it's your resume to the world. Uh, what else do I have here? Just to bear with me, I just got two more things. Um, accept change, expect change. Roll with the punches. If you can't adapt when you're young, it will be difficult or impossible to change as you get older. So, uh, one more thing. Um, there was an interesting article written by Tom Friedman. Um, uh, he wrote about the five hiring attributes Google looks for. Number one, learning ability. The ability to process on the fly is important. It's not your IQ. It's not expertise. Leadership. When faced with a problem, you're a member of a team. At the appropriate time, did you step in and lead? Humility and ownership. What can we do together to solve a problem? Without humility, you aren't able to learn. 
collaboration and adaptability. Loving to learn and relearn. Laszlo Black, he's a senior VP of Google, and he says, beware, your degree is not a proxy for your ability to do any job. The world only cares about and pays off on what you can do with what you know, and it doesn't care how you learned it. So it's what you know. The last thing I'd like to say, always conduct yourself with the highest degree of integrity. When looking at companies, I said it before in my opening talk, for a career choice, look at their leadership. Look at how they conduct themselves, their business affairs. Read about them. Have they had any problems? And how they treat people. Those are companies you want to work for. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, any, yeah. What's your name? Eric. Eric? Yeah. Well, the decision was my, not mine. Uh, we go through, and companies go through a very extensive interview process. They can afford to be choosy these days. So they're, they're, they're looking for the complete package. Uh, LinkedIn has become extremely important, I would say, in the past year, particularly maybe even within the past six months. That's how, how quickly LinkedIn uh, has, has become important to business. Um, it's an indication, an insight of what you think of yourself and, and, and how you care about yourself. And it's one of the few things that you can share with people that don't know you. Uh, this particular person that wasn't hired didn't know our HR person. Uh, they had a discussion on the phone, but uh, you know, the person flunked the interview uh, with, 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 with just that, just a, well, not only that, but didn't have a great understanding. But the other thing too is when you interview, understand the company, have a good insight into that company. Don't show up not knowing about the company. Okay, that was the other, that was the other problem. The person had a good history, had a good reputation. Uh, I knew that, others knew that, but you know, everybody has to be on board these days before someone is hired. So, uh, you know, get a good understanding of the business before you interview and make sure that LinkedIn profile is up to snuff. Don't lie about it because you're going to be, that's your resume, that's your, you know, that's who you are. And it makes you distinct. So if uh, you make sure that everything you put on LinkedIn is the truth, you know, you don't want to sit there and make stuff up. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really an insight into who you are and, you know, uh, employers will pick up on that. They're, they're looking for good people. You know, they're, you know jobs are, are not easy to get, but they're out there. So, you know, you need to make yourself relevant, distinct. And that's kind of why I say, you know, you know, going to college for four years is a wonderful thing and being smart is a wonderful thing too, but you got to, you know, separate yourself, yourself from the crowd and make yourself distinct and relevant. And, you know, the more things you do, the more things you participated in, it makes you a complete person and shows that you're multidimensional. Does that answer your question, Eric? Huh, kind of? Well, what, what, did I, what did I answer on that? Because I... Here's why I would have. Because the company was coming from did not place an emphasis on that, but we do. So I say give the person a chance because uh, the person I knew could do the job, but they didn't know that. Uh, and, and, and companies are really taking LinkedIn very seriously. 
Uh, just because he did not have a good LinkedIn file doesn't mean he wasn't good. But to the HR expert, that's all they know. You know, they've got to have the, the resumes, you know, the right margins. They've got to have their LinkedIn profile. You know, that's what they look for. So, you know, it's very difficult to convince hiring that person when, when, when you know, they didn't, they didn't have everything checked off. So, I would have. <laughs> Questions? Anything? Any question? No question? All right, then. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.